Coming to you from Silver Lake, Los Angeles, California, home of LARB HQ, this is the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I'm Colin Marshall, sitting down today with Nick Antosca, who's the author of novels and non-novels and now a book of short stories. These include Fires, Midnight Picnic, The Obese, and the new short story collection, The Girlfriend Game, with another novella coming out in December called The Hangman's Ritual. The Girlfriend Game, though, I, reading it, I was like, is this... Am I going to call this an intro, a good introduction, a gateway to the Nick Antosca sensibility, or is it is it for fans of yours who want to get like concentrated hits of your themes? How do you think of it? I think it's actually a great introduction. Um, in fact, if anybody was going to uh, wanted an example of the kind of strange stuff that I write, uh, the Girlfriend Game is a great place to start. Hmm. I feel like it's a telling anecdote. You've said it in another interview that you were deciding to call this either, what, Mammals or The Girlfriend Game? That was Those were the two possible titles? And yeah. uh, they said the girlfriend publisher was like, Girlfriend Game, uh, Sex Sells, Girlfriends uh, Imply Sex. And indeed, it's not a false label, is it? I, not at all. Um, there's a lot of sex in the book. Uh, the Girlfriend Game is a story that has uh, kind of a, a sort of sexy vibe to it. Um, and uh, I, I sort of like the mysteriousness of the title Mammals, uh, but my publisher was absolutely right. The Girlfriend Game is the title of the collection. Uh, it had to be. Publishers publishers never quite go for mysteriousness, do they? And, well, some kinds, maybe. Uh, I, you know, I, 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 yeah, sometimes. Jackie, uh, Jackie Corley of Word Riot, um, you know, has, has a pretty, pretty good sensibility, uh, but it, it, the girlfriend game is just a sexier title, right? Uh, and and you know, I, it's just sort of a little bit more representative of what the collection is. I feel like. Mm -hmm. So, the t the title story might as well get in through that the girlfriend game. It's got this couple, and the thing they do is the girl goes to get hit on by guys at bars while the boyfriend watches, and then he jumps in and, and quote, steals her away. You know, they, they, at least the dude is left there thinking he's been, uh, the girl's been stolen from him, but it's been prearranged. And then things get turned around uh, in the iteration of the game they play in this story. But I was reading this, and it's like, I've known a few people for whom that game was a pastime. Like, literally, not not the way it turns out in your story, because readers, you read it, and experience the, the experience the askew way it turns out in the story, but that sort of that thing where a, a boyfriend watches his girlfriend get hit on at bars. Like I realized, I've heard a few people talk about that as an actual thing they do just for kicks. Uh, it sounds like a kind of a a very I, I'm going kind of as I will strike that out a very unappealing pastime to me. I take it in the circles you've run in though you've heard of this happening. Um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I know as many people as you apparently know who have actually done that. Right. Uh, however, it, it just comes from a kind of, um, uh, conversation with a girlfriend a long time ago of like, what if we did that? Right. Uh, you, you know, there's always the, the experience you have of you step away from your significant other at a party or a bar or something and somebody's talking to them and you can sort of sit back and say, you know, it, it's just interesting to watch that dynamic play out. And the story comes from just the what if game. Right. So, it, it, you know, I, I don't actually know anybody who has played the game the way it's played in the story, right. but I want to meet your friends. <laughs> I mean, I never heard this spoken about and was like, whoa, I got to try it. That's, <laughs> right. you know, the variety is of what is a turn on. I mean, that, are, are you fascinated by people being turned on by things that you are not turned on by? Yeah, I mean, uh, Crash, uh, obviously the the J.G. Ballard version, not the uh, Academy Award winning thing. <laughs> um, you know, that that's a perfect example of uh, a, a, a piece of fiction that explores that sort of that question of like why are people turned turned on by uh, the thing, things that they're turned on by. I mean, it's it's it lays bare the kind of strangeness and idiosyncrasy of human attraction. Mm. The strangeness and idiosyncrasy of human attraction. I I, I want to get a sense. Is there is there any story in in this book that doesn't have something to do with the strangeness and idiosyncrasy of human attraction? I can think of contenders that may not, but in some way that seems like it's at the center of. Almost all of them. Yeah, offhand, uh, the the title story, Rat Beast, maybe, mm -hmm. which is almost a fable. It's not uh, structured in the way the the other stories are, and it has really 
it's one of the only stories, maybe the only story that's not uh, kind of a relationship story. Mm. I mean, I guess amphibian, but although that, that's a story of a guy and his mother, it's not really. But but I think Rat Beast is is the outlier. Mm. One, there's one story in here that it's it's especially that that's especially apparent the strangeness of human attraction, or rather, it's a story where the exploitation of that is important. Uh, I I never actually saw that series to catch a predator. Uh, where they set up a house and and uh, invite fellows chatting up they, who they think are underage ladies on the internet to come to the house and then catch them on camera. I, I guess that that was a big thing. And I, but I retroactively looked up like everything about it after I read a story in here that has some similarities in, in setup to that. I mean, that. Tell me about how that appeared to you. That type of show, that type of reality show, came to you as a possible had had fictional possibilities for you. Well, that show was. Uh, sort of a cultural meme for a while. Yeah. I mean, I, whatever it was five or six years ago. I, were you able to find, because I haven't looked them up for a while, were you able to find those clips on YouTube? I haven't seen the clips because I think it's almost better to envision, like it's never going to be as good as the capture, you know, you write about in this show that you have, uh, that you invent for the story. You write about uh, the way the cops capture these guys when they try to run from the house right. or the way the confrontations go down. I feel like they're better imagined than seen. Am well, I... Am I Right on that. What I described in the story that this story you're talking about is predator bait, which is about uh, a young woman who's hired to play the 13 year old. Because when they when they would do these shows, of course, it would be an adult on the computer pretending to be a 13 year old, and the creepy guy would come to the house and they would tell him, you know, bring the Zima or the wine coolers and yes. the condoms and all this, <laughs> um, and you know, to to demonstrate intent. But then the guy would get to the house, and of course they couldn't have the person who was on the computer, or who was clearly an adult, right. uh, standing there and offering him cookies or whatever. So they would hire an actress who looked 12 or 13 and would really be 18 or 19. And uh, I just remember finding a bunch of clips of those moments on YouTube mm -hmm. at, at some point. I never watched the show when it was on the air. Mm -hmm. uh, but they would just be the indiv individual scenes chopped up on the internet. Right. And you would see these sad sack, like creepy guys show up at the house with their, you know, their, their, uh, like Kool-Aid or whatever, yes. uh, just being really creepy, uh, and desperate. And, and then they would come in and the girl would be there. And it, it was just like the most tragic, sad, difficult to watch kind of revolting scene right. played out over and over again. And sometimes the guy would, you know, they would like run away and they would get tasered. Nice. Uh, and some of the guys were just like so loathsome and off putting. And some of them just looked like, you know, really sad, lonely right. guys. Uh, and it, it just seemed like such a complicated human story from all perspectives, you know, from the guy's perspectives, from the actress's perspective. Uh, the, the, the one guy who seemed like really particularly skeevy was the host, right. uh, who, who was, uh, just very like slick and kind of creepy and, and, uh, moralizing and uh it, it was just such a skin crawling thing that uh i thought it'd be interesting to tell that story from the perspective of of the person you would least likely see see it told from uh so the story is told from the perspective of of the actress right i mean are we are we back in ancient rome with lions and christians is this, is this what what this show is like it just it's just sort of throwing uh bait to the slaughter isn't it well i i think uh the lions and christians thing is sort of a a mu or, uh, a, a pure and more defensible sort of entertainment <laughs> you know the the lions lions and christians I, that's uh, <laughs> I, uh obviously i'm exaggerating but um uh you know i would i would I'm more forgiving of a grotesque horror movie or action movie than I am of uh, entertainment like that. Mm -hmm. Reading about the actual series, the actual series where they did all these all these uh, capturings, I, I was just reading the synopses of each episode or each special they did. And as you go down, you see that more of the actual guys captured were, some were fans of the show, like more had seen right. it. Some were like religious followers right. of To Catch a Predator. Some were caught multiple times. I think. <laughs> I, I, and ultimately, uh, a lot of those prosecutions were thrown out. Oh, okay. um, yeah, because they're entrapment issues. I, not Certainly not all of them. I mean, I think some people went to jail because of that. But um, there were there were prosecutors who just threw it out mm. because it was you know so sketchy. Mm. And we've already discussed a couple types of voyeurism here. There's there's a certain voyeurism with the viewers of these shows who they just they want they want to see this happening before their eyes. And and there's 
there's the voyeurism that somebody playing a girlfriend game like the one with the title enjoys. I mean, what's do you have any creative stake in voyeurism per se? <laughs> Am I a voyeur? Well, not uh, are you a voyeur, but are, do you have do you, do you feel like your work has and voyeurism is important in your work now and in, in the way you conceive it? Yeah, maybe. I mean, just as a storytelling technique, a scene is almost always more interesting when somebody's watching. Um, that's just a, a, a kind of guiding storytelling principle. Um, you know, it, it's just an extra element. Right. Uh, I don't, I, I don't know if I'm self-aware enough to analyze my stories from that perspective, mm. but I have to say probably yes to your I question. See. I see. There's a sense in which reading your stories, you get the feeling that I, I would really rather be the voyeur. If this is in the, in the world, these stories take place, you're safer as a voyeur than anything else. Like everybody else's, the, the voyeurs are sometimes the least troubled. You know yeah. what I mean? Well, here, here's a, a, a meta voyeurism anecdote for you. I just came over here from, uh, from the set of the short film of The Girlfriend Game, which is being shot wow. in, in West Hollywood this weekend. Um, so I have spent the last like two hours watching a guy who, uh, an actor named Jeff Ward, who is the lead of The Girlfriend Game, uh, and who's great. Um, and he's dressed like kind of like I would be dressed, uh, yeah. and he's playing this character that I wrote, um, and he's being a voyeur, and I'm watching him, uh, and it's just a very surreal experience. I mean, it's weird being on, on set for something you wrote. Um, it's but like the uh, hall of mirrors stretching downward. It's like, whoa, yeah. vertigo. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's a little disorienting. Uh, it's very exciting, though. Mm. How, how long a, a range over your career do these stories span? Basically all of it. Mm. Um, I, I'm not sure what the earliest story in the collection is. I know that I wrote some of them in college. Uh, the, the last story, um, uh, Clown Blood, is about 10 years old. Mm. Uh, and so I, I, I've been writing for, you know, 10, 12 years. Um, and I, I would write when I had a day job in New York mm. for five years. Um, I was writing stories when I was in college. And these stories in The Girlfriend Game are collected from over that period of time. All or almost all of them have been published in various magazines or websites mm -hmm. along the way. And I've probably written, you know, through twice or three times as many stories during that time as there are in the book. Mm -hmm. And I just pick my favorite ones uh, when we decided to put a, a collection together. Now, tell me about reading, again, a story like Clown Blood, an early story in, in the scope of your career. What, what do you... What are you? What kind of reactions do you have to reading something from the beginning? You know, is it is it like, wow, that was that's better. The, I did these things better than I thought I would, or is it like, well, I'm only going to find fault because that's how I'll improve? Well, it's both actually. Um, I, uh, I I I'm I'm impressed sometimes. I'm like, wow, I I don't think I could write this story now. I'm a, I, that that's cool, and I like the story, and it feels like somebody else wrote it. Um, on the other hand, there are definitely things that I would change. Uh, there are things that I would cut in some cases, largely as a result of having worked as a screenwriter now where I, I'm much, much more maniacal about uh, cutting things down. Um, and, you know, I, I was saying this to somebody else recently, the, the Girlfriend Game is would be a much longer story if I had written it seven or eight years ago. Um, and... Uh, if I wrote the clown blood story now, it would probably be shorter. I'm not saying the story itself should be shorter. Right. Uh, I, I, you know, if I, if I had wanted to cut it down, I could have, uh, before we published it. Um, but, but I can see the differences in my writing style then and now hmm. for sure. How quickly does screenwriting take that, uh, machete to whatever length you were thinking of writing in before, but before you began screenwriting? Um, Pretty quickly because you just learn – story is is everything in screenwriting. I mean, structure is everything, and you just learn that uh, scenes should never be longer than they have to be, and you got to get in late and get out early. Nice. Um, and, and, and connective tissue and, and padding is – generally not necessary. Mm. Um, so you just have more of a, 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 a sense of urgency in the, in the writing process and a sense of what's necessary and what's not necessary. Mm. You do hear a lot about, you hear from, say, certain filmmakers about how the screenplay format itself is a bit crippling to the 
to the use of the full creative space of, of film or of television. Do you think that is because of the double-edged sword we've been talking about, where it's, you know, get in late, get out early? And are we, do we, when you're writing a screenplay, are you, are you thinking that much differently because of the way a screenplay is, because of the limitations of the format, because it's going into another medium? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, there's something inherently limiting about the fact that when you write a screenplay, you can write the best possible story. Uh, you can write the best possible screenplay of the story that you're intending to write. You can do exactly everything that you want to do. And still, what you have when you're finished is not a finished artistic product. Mm. It's not It's not a novel. Uh, it's not the finished film. And you can write a screenplay that you're really proud of and is really good. And when the finished artistic project, the, you know, the, the final film, is made – it may or may not reflect that quality. Um, there are just there are just uh, so many other factors involved that can that can cripple you a little bit. When you return to the page, writing a story, writing a novel after having put in the hours, screenwriting, what does it feel like? Um, it, it's daunting and it's also a relief. Uh, it's a relief because I know that I have total control over the over the final artistic product. Uh, it's daunting because there are like extra dimensions to worry about. Do you know what I mean? There's there's this kind of dimension of uh, it, uh, there's an experiential di- dimension that just isn't present in screenplays. I mean, in a screenplay, you are not describing the inner life of the character. Um, you're dramatizing it, but you're not sort of living in it and, and fleshing it out. Uh, one reason I primarily write in first person now that I've uh, started working in, in screen, screenplays regularly is it's just a, a, a dimension I don't you don't explore in a screenplay. So um, I, you, obviously you always write screenplays in third person. Uh, and uh, when I sit down to write fiction and I, I want to be in a space that I'm not in when I'm writing a script. I want to get a sense of how you can how how you mentioned the the, the voice the the writing writing in first person more often now, and I I want to know how you think you see the voices develop across the stories in the girlfriend game. You know what what can you see specifically about the voices, the characters you you talk through, and how they change as you go. Actually, what surprised me putting the story collection together is uh, how consistent the mood and tone was. Mm -hmm. I don't really think of myself as a fiction writer with a specific voice. I mean, Mm -hmm. I feel like I write stuff that's all over the map in terms of subject matter uh, and sometimes style. I mean, I feel like my my novels are pretty different. Mm -hmm. Um, In terms of the voice, the the whatever the, the authorial voice or is that even a word um, <laughs> probably it's a word it's, uh, I it's a word. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I i feel i was surprised at how similar it was across the stories hmm. um and i was pleased i was pleased because i don't feel like i consciously developed a voice and one of the things that i've always been self-conscious about as a fiction writer is that i felt that i didn't have a specific niche or style i mean Mm. you read a george saunders story you know it's a george saunders story it's it's so distinct um you read uh something by tao lin you you know it's uh you know who it is um unless it's one of his many imitators but they never do it as well as he does uh and uh, and and i never consciously tried to develop that and i always was worried that i i didn't have something distinctive enough um and and seeing the stories collected together assuage that fear a little bit tell me about what kind of protagonist you find yourself having to work with most often hmm um that's a good question i don't know i i feel like uh insecure ones insecure i mean they're ones. they're the, they're they're the most interesting uh i'm not, not secure in what part of themselves it, it depends on the character. Yeah. I mean, what, uh, what types of insecurity interest you the most? I'll say that. Um, it, man, uh, maybe insecurity in relationships. Mm. Uh, I mean, the girlfriend game is a, is a great example of that, right. and probably the prime example of that in this particular collection. Um, you know, obviously they play this game. 
driven by the narrator, who's the guy, uh, because he because he it's a power trip because he's insecure. Um, and then the rug gets pulled out from under him and the girl turns the tables on him in this game and his in- insecurity is exposed in a huge way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, that's interesting. And another, another kind of, uh, insecurity that's interesting to me is, um, a lack of awareness or a, a willful delusional quality about your own, uh, the narrator's own, um, uh, history or our own traumas or, uh, problems. And that's, um, that's m- a lot of what the, my first novel fires is about. Mm. How, how do we most interestingly willfully delude ourselves? Um, uh, by, by just ignoring the problem. Just uh, ignoring the, We say just ignoring, but ignoring as anyone who has ignored things, which is all people, uh, no, is not. It's not really that easy, is it? There's there's a, a lot of mental. If you're trying not to know something or acknowledge something, that eats up a big chunk of your mental bandwidth, like every single day, right? It can. Mm-hmm. It can. I mean, I think it depends on you know what what the uh, what the nature of your uh, wound is, mm-hmm. um, and. I mean, it could be, it could be a relationship where somebody's, you know, somebody's fucking with you or somebody is uh, using you and you just don't want to admit it because to lose them would be to uh, sort of, you know, face the void or whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I mean, that that's, that's kind of the most obvious one that comes to mind. Mm. Mm. What, what tends to make your characters so insecure other than that that's how you write them? Um. Honestly, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Mm, they're uh, already insecure by the time you get there. Yeah, it, I mean, in some cases, I know. I mean, the 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 character, the narrator in Fires, um, has uh, had some experiences in his past that he would just rather not uh, face or acknowledge, and um, things explode because of that. Mm. Would you consider these stories, for the most part? Scary? Not in the traditional sense. Uh, some of them are creepy. I would I would describe them more as unsettling. Unsettling stories. Hmm. That's it's that makes sense to me. But people do also write about your writing as if it is as if there are horrific elements to it. I guess. And you could you would you say there are horrific elements? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some some more so than others. Uh, the creature that is presented in the t- in in the first story rat beast yes. i think is outright horrifying um as is the possibility of what might happen to the main character uh there are other stories like mammals which has uh you know an, an explicitly horrifying character slash moment in it i mean there's a serial killer in that yes. story um there are other stories in the collection that have really explicit violence uh the story well, one of the stories that people seem to find most unsettling slash anxiety inducing is uh, is the title story, The Girlfriend Game, mm, just yes. because uh, it it plays on fears that everybody has in relationships. Actually, you know what? It, it's male readers mm. uh, who tend to find that one really anxiety inducing. Women seem yeah. to like the story and find it, you know, sexy or, or uh, particularly engaging. Um, it's actually a, a very uh, very clear gender split on that story. I suppose that, yeah, there was a large part of me that didn't want to go on reading that story, but I did want to go on because it was, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, an interesting story to read, but there's that element, which I think is pretty, I mean, let me, let me guess that's deliberate. You want the male reader to struggle through it in a, in a, in a way. Yeah. Uh, I'm very flattered when uh, people tell me that. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that it unsettled you. <laughs> But is it was that an effect you found happened, or were you writing this thinking and this this is a story that will I want to write a story that a male reader will have a hard time getting through because typically we talk about it's the other way around a man can read through anything, but a woman gets squeamish and closes the book. You know what I mean? I I I did not write it specifically mm-hmm. to I I don't really think about that when I'm writing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think about character and I also think about like mood and atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Um, in some ways, I when I'm writing a short story, I think about it as a short film. Like mm-hmm. I can picture it as a short film in my head. Um, 
I can sort of see what it would look like. I can vaguely hear the music. Um, but, uh, but I don't think like, you know, like Chuck Palahniuk guts <laughs> legendarily, <laughs> like, Oh, I'm going to make people throw up. You know, yes. I, I, I don't come at stories that way. I usually start with an image and I think like, wow, that would be, that'd be cool. I want to build something around that. Mm. Um, and I also, I, I write from kind of a cinematic perspective too. And in, in that, uh, I feel like a lot of the short stories that I read are um, vignettes, really. Mm -hmm. And they're stories about, uh, you know, somebody um, opens the mail and there's a little thing there that reminds him of something and he contemplates his life and uh, nothing changes on the surface, but right. something huge changes in his psyche. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not, I don't know how to write that story. <laughs> uh, I, I like to write stories where something happens uh, and you've never seen it happen that way before. And a character has to make a choice, uh, or, or not, you know, or, or, or refuses to make a choice. Um, and there, there's, there's a story. Mm. Now the, the elements you use to create that unsettlement, I guess you might say unsettledness in the reader. Some of them, as we've said, are pretty elements of the horrific, could you allow yourself to use those from the very beginning, from when you started writing? Like, I can put a horrible beast into a story if it needs it, or I can put a serial killer in there. I mean, I can easily, easily imagine a writer saying, no, those are for Stephen King books. Right. But were, how, what was your experience? No, um, I mean, I feel like the question there is, is were you always a genre writer? And yeah, absolutely. Well, do, you, do you say you're one now? I guess that's another question. Um, I, yeah, I, I, uh, you know what, if you ask me that question on a different day, I might say no, oh, I uh, see. but, it's the best uh, kind of genre writer to be is sometimes <laughs> you're not one. Right. I, I have no, uh, no aversion whatsoever to a genre label uh, mm -hmm. or to genre, uh, tropes. Um, right. I mean, I, I certainly never worried about like being, uh, in the Stephen King, you know, universe. I, I was, I love Stephen King. I was reading Stephen mm -hmm. King when I was a little kid. Um, and in terms of putting stuff that that's horrific or grotesque in my writing, uh, I recently, uh, saw some, some pictures that I had drawn when I was a kid, of, uh, like a story. I mean, this was something my mom found in the attic. And it, you know, it's like skulls chasing dinosaurs. That kind of shit. It's just like, uh, were they floating skulls or did they have legs? I mean, the, my, my art skills at that age were not fantastic. Oh, um, could have been anything. I, 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 I actually am a decent artist, you know, so, but, but there was, there was not a true, like maybe the skull was floating right. and maybe it was <laughs> resting in a sea of like, I don't know. But, sure. uh, but I, I do remember like pictures of just like skulls and right. yelling at each other and stuff like that. <laughs> um, so I've never ever been squeamish about doing that kind of stuff. Mm. If anything, uh, I feel like, in in when I started writing fiction seriously um, and trying to get it published, I tried to force myself to pull back from that mm -hmm. somewhat. Uh, and I think I think the stories in the Girlfriend Game are a nice mix of explicitly genre and kind of realist. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the Girlfriend Game story, there's no genre element whatsoever. It's a relationship story. Right. Um, there are stories like uh, like migrations, which are hugely genre centric. I mean, that's stories about the end of the world. There are strange creatures. Um, there are stories like uh, the early years uh, before his great adventures. That's the full title of the story, uh, which is kind of fable like and told in a, in a tall tale style. Although there are no explicit, um, you know, fanciful beasts or anything like that. Nice. That's one that goes, that I would imagine draws something from your uh, Louisiana roots, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think actually almost all the stories draw something or other, if only in tone or mood, from New Orleans. I mean, mm. when I was, uh, I left New Orleans when I was young. Um, and so I only remember living there in a very uh, vivid, um, kind of distorted, kind of amplified way. And then after that, it was like, normal suburban childhood right, and the right. two things. But I, I think my sensibility was formed a little bit by Louisiana, you know, New Orleans seen through the, through the eyes of a little kid is almost like 
more New Orleans. It's like New Orleans squared, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I can I can just remember uh, wandering out of preschool and like wandering over to the park or uh, to you know strange people's houses. I feel like um, I'm lucky that I wasn't murdered as uh, a small child. Um, and it was uh, an unsettling place. It, it was it, well, it wasn't at the time, but in retrospect, uh, and. You know, it was a very, very crime ridden place mm-hmm. and we didn't live in a good neighborhood at all. Mm-hmm. And I, I I wasn't aware at the time that we didn't, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we would go back and visit later, the last time I was in New Orleans uh, was 2006 mm-hmm. after I think that's right. After Katrina. And it was like a year after Katrina. And I was there with my now screenwriting partner, Ned Vizzini, who we were just uh, friends who would hang out at the time. We went because a friend of ours was shooting a movie outside of the city and we would... Um, Enjoying those tax breaks, right? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, there, it was like some horror movie out, out in the swamp. And we, uh, as like every horror movie looks like mm-hmm. New Orleans now. Uh, but So we would drive in, into the city and it was still completely dark uh, at night. You know, there were, there were all these abandoned houses and the houses had... Uh, the orange spray paint on them um, and the weird symbols that were like, you know, body. F- I don't know what they meant, but um, uh, I just remember this is actually described a little bit in uh, Midnight Picnic, mm. which partly takes place in Louisiana. Um, we would go to we went to uh, the French Quarter and everything was dark. You know, there were no cop cars anywhere. It was very, very creepy, uh, except for Bourbon Street and the strip clubs, which is like bright and loud and noisy and one block in any direction, like totally dark, goes down. It's very, oh, oh. very, very creepy. Hmm. Living here in Los Angeles now, I mean, this place has its own brand of unsettledness, doesn't it? This mm-hmm. do, both, both cities can make you unsettled, right? You, you particularly. Yeah, I feel like... Um, you know, Los Angeles is a much wilder, weirder place than New York, where I lived for five years beforehand, or certainly than, than Maryland. Um, but you, most people only know the Hollywood Hills from like reality TV, where it looks like this sort of uh, fancy, rich place with the mansions and all this. Um, and there's a lot of different parts of the Hollywood Hills. Uh, some of them are like weird and seedy, and uh, some of the some of the you know the the roads are smooth. Um, I live I sublet in a house in uh, kind of the West Hollywood Hills, which is um, it's sort of a creepy place. I mean, the Hollywood Hills are a very very spooky place. Uh, you know, you you you're walking home at night and there's like coyotes running by and they stop and they look at you. Um, and I have. Uh, uh, the place where I live, my bedroom is actually um, sort of separate from the house. Mm-hmm. So I have to leave my bedroom. I walk outside the house, then I walk into the main house. Um, and like every night, almost when I open the door, there's like an animal out there looking, you know, it'll be like a <laughs> skunk or something uh, just staring at me. Um, and you can hear things in the hills from way far over. You know, they echo across the canyons. Yeah. They can hear people screaming at each other sometimes or freaking out or sobbing or like having uh, glorious parties. Um, and you can also hear – you have the, the experience that everybody in LA, L.A. has. If you hear some like crazy, dramatic, horrible thing happening, it's like, is that really happening? Or are they actors rehearsing yeah, exactly. a scene? You know, oh, it's oh. constant. Um but uh, the Hollywood Hills are, are one of my favorite places that I've ever been. It's mm. so, so strange. There's so much history. Mm. Um, and uh, I live not far from, you know, like multiple famous murder houses, which is, <laughs> is, is weird, right? Mm. And, and, and uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a strange place, yeah. Mm. What, what, when you're reading stories or novels by others, do you find, do you tend to find legitimately scary? Hmm. Um... I don't know. I, it, it's been a while since a book has scared me. Um, or do you do that thing where, like, like comedians do, where they hear a joke and like, "Hey, it's funny." Like they don't yeah. laugh, but they know that's funny. Like they'll tell you what's funny very precisely and accurately, but they won't laugh. Do you have the same thing with what's scary? 
Yeah, I don't know. I I, I want to say no. I want to say no because I like to believe that I can still be scared. But I haven't read a horror novel that scared me in a long time. Mm. Um, I loved I loved Joe Hill's Horns. That's one of which came out maybe two years ago. I'm not sure. Uh, that was one of my favorite recent horror novels. I just got his new book Nosferatu, which I haven't finished yet. And I've, I've barely gotten into, but I'm really excited about. Um, the last thing that actually scared me was the movie The Conjuring. I mean, there were, there mm-hmm. were a couple scenes in it that, that scared me. It wasn't, it wasn't like a terrifying movie, but there were one or two scenes where I was just like really impressed by, you know, the kind of classical way they did it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you have any recommendations, let me know. I, I would love to be scared by a novel again. It's been a while. The only thing that ever scares me is that part in The Shining, uh, the Kubrick's movie of it, where they uh, look down the hallway and there's that guy in the bear suit staring oh, at sure. them yeah so that's it's just that pretty much. i recommend that part of the shining yeah. so you know minute 110 of the shining just put that on scariest movie ever made no yeah. question i mean certainly other parts are effective too but it's always the bear man when i maybe it's a dog suit i don't know i hear that has some backstory in the stephen king novel but i would prefer not to know right. the characters in the girlfriend game sometimes they're scared by legitimately scary thing well i don't want to say legitimately but obviously scary things like they're in harm's way like a serial killer has captured them but a lot of times it seems like the characters are scared of their own is it their own impulses or their own yeah. the way they think about things like they're scared of something inside themselves more i mean maybe half the time it's they're scaring themselves. Maybe they don't know it's themselves, but you know what I mean? There's a few monsters in the girlfriend game, but mostly the monsters are, you know, the, the people's, uh, people's own impulses, um, their own inability to, uh, face, uh, consequences, um, their, uh, their, their own disgust with themselves. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's scarier and, and more relatable, I think, to, it's more relatable to readers, for mm. sure. It, it does seem like you see mentioned being disgusted disgusted with themselves, but like self loathing is a scarier and more clear and present right. problem than than obviously serial killers, but um, any of the things we would think to be scared of, right? It's like our our own. We can turn on ourselves so quickly and not even realize it. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the, there's a story uh, called Sophie Ann, which is. Almost entirely sexy in the, the mm-hmm. whole, but uh, it's driven by the main character, who is a woman, uh, her kind of disgust and, and confusion at something that she herself has done. Um, and that's that's the core of that story. Mm. I wonder if that operates differently to your mind on male and female characters. Are they are is it two different breeds of self-loathing or is it is it all just a one human thing, fun, one phenomenon? Uh, if it breaks down by gender, I'm not sure how it does. Um, it, it may if you sort of analyze things, but I, I, I don't, I don't certainly don't consciously approach the characters um, uh, coming from from any beginning with gender. Mm. Um, I feel well. The Sovian, that main character, wouldn't really be a guy because of the mechanics of uh, you know marriage proposal, right. but uh, yeah. but. Um, other than that, you know, other than sort of logistical reasons like that, I, I, I don't come at characters from a place of uh, uh, thinking about their gender first. Hmm. I want to not forget to mention, I mean, I, at, the, at the beginning I alluded to you having a, you having a novella coming out in December, yeah. uh, The Hangman's Ritual. Now, tell me, I want to establish where, how this sort of locks in with the rest of the work you already have out, the novels and the, the, the collection and all that. Um, a lot of the other stories and, uh, and, and books, as we, you know, mentioned before, uh, are about characters who are kind of locked in their own prisons. You know, uh, they're, they're locked in with their secrets. Uh, they're, um, they're forcing themselves not to see something that's obvious, no. uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the hangman's ritual is about a guy who's literally in a prison, mm-hmm. uh, that he has kind of, he's kind of responsible for, for getting himself in. He's basically, it's, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the movie old boy, yes. where the guy's locked in a prison, uh, the main character in this novella is sort of, um, sort of like if, if, He's like one of the guards in that prison, mm. uh, and but he's he's the only guard, and he's he executes prisoners too. Mm. Um, and this guy has been working, you know, in this. It's like a it's like a private hotel, sort of in hidden in a building in Manhattan, where this mm. uh, someone keeps prisoners locked in in rooms. 
um, and he's the the administrator there. And gradually, he comes to realize that uh, all is not what he believes in 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 the prison. Uh, that there are prisoners in the prison who are uh, not who he thinks they are. Mm. Um, and then, of course, he ends up a prisoner there himself and yeah. has to escape before he loses his mind. <laughs> so, do you really consider this a a certain literalization of of themes you had used before in putting this guy in an actual prison? Yes. Um, now that I think about it, I wasn't thinking about that when I wrote it. Hmm. What did that? What did it give you when you were able to just make that? You know, you have many an imprisoned character in your work, but now you have one who is at least in a concrete prison, right? What does that offer you in terms of? Does it give you? What does it, what does it give you? Um, it gives you more opportunities for uh, for for drama that's literal rather than abstract. Mm. Um, I mean, you can have the guy, he can literally break out of the prison, you know, by like kicking down doors of which you can't do if your prison is psychological. Mm. Mm. Now you mentioned old boy, um, John Luke Park's uh, movie. And it's, it's one that I've seen a couple times myself as well. I, I've heard you mention it in, in other contexts. So what, what do you like so much about old boy? Man, I, I, a lot of things. I don't, I'm not sure how to answer that question because um, I, how do you define what what you really what really affects you? I, I I'm not sure I can dissect why that movie in particular um, uh, means so much to me. I mean, part of it is the craft. It's a mm. it's a incredibly well crafted movie and executed on every level. Um, it's uh, it's also. Uh, you know, it, it speaks to those themes that um, that come up of being trapped in your own prison, of uh, of struggling to uh, learn a, 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 a truth about yourself. Um, it that movie just packs a lot of things that I'm interested in into one package. Uh, that is really, really, really well done. Um, and you know, my my other, I'd say that and the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert oh, Ford yes. are, are my favorite movies from you know, the last 10, 15 years. Um, and both of them, you know, they have the same just extraordinary level of execution. Uh, and, uh, and they both almost uncannily explore themes that I've, uh, found really interesting always. A couple things there. On, uh, of course, I, I can agree with you on both those movies, especially the assassination of Jesse James. Uh, yeah, but we'll start there. That that's a film. Uh, fewer people have seen it, but it's a film where you don't know. You have the character of Jesse James, and you're not quite sure what's driving him. And that itself gets scarier as you go along because you're like you're like you don't know. You you know the character less as you go along. Yeah. You you know what I mean? Well, on on second you know or many on repeat viewings, one of the things that's really interesting about that character is that he just seems suicidal. Like right. w once you uh, know where the movie's going, he seems suicidal from mm. at least halfway through, uh, and it, it it seems pretty clear that he's like driven just by a, a death impulse. Mm. Those moments when he's you know, shooting through the ice and right. that kind of thing. Um, Nothing scarier than someone driven by a death impulse because they don't care. Right, 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 right. Um, and uh, the relationship between the two of them, uh, uh, Robert Ford and Jesse James, is a uh, kind of relationship that I always find really interesting in fiction of like mm. hero worship uh, and mentorship and mm. uh, a powerful figure sort of uh, who, who's very uh, charismatic and alluring, but but can't really be trusted. Um, right. I mean, but that's a powerful figure past the prime here as well. Like yeah. uh, this is a, a post powerful, powerful figure in a sense. He's still powerful, but not, I mean, it's uh time has humanized him a bit too much. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, uh, oddly enough, uh, when I was, you know, that, that's a, that's a relationship that, um, is compelling in movies like Fight Club and Apocalypse Now and Training Day, all of which are some of, some of my favorite movies in part because that relationship is explored. And, and, and that's a relationship that, um, uh, without realizing it, I put in, uh, in fires a little bit, mm. my, my first novel. Um, yeah, the, the, you know, so those are some of my favorite movies. It makes me think about the instances in specifically the girlfriend game, since that's the newest book, the instances where you have a dynamic between two men, and the one that comes to mind is, is the story where one guy goes back to his hometown so he can kill the guy who killed his girlfriend who oh, has yeah. just gotten out of prison. I mean, that's 
And that's one of those stories. Tell me if you agree where the relationship between them seems very straightforward. And then you just kind of don't know what to think by the end of it. Like one of them is dead at the end and you're not, you know what happened in terms of the actions, but like, I don't know what happened also. Yeah. I mean, that's a story that I wrote a long time ago. I wrote that in college too. Um, I, I'm still very happy with it. Uh, but it, that's, that's one of the stories when I look at it, I'm like, I don't know how I'd write this today. I don't know. What, what do you think wouldn't have come out of you in that story today? I don't know. I, I think partly just the style. Um, but, uh, but I think what happens in that story, if, if I try and look at it just from the perspective of a reader, because I can't remember exactly what what I was thinking um, when I wrote it, but I, I feel like, you know, what happens there is is uh, it's a story about the revenge impulse being so strong that, you know, he, he plans to kill this guy. He comes home uh, and he has a he has a connection with him and he re he, he feels for him a little bit and um and then he kills him anyway, mm. uh, which is kind of the, you know, the tragedy. And then he doesn't have anything to do with himself right. because uh, because that was his whole whole reason for existing. Mm. And so he had to do it. Right. It's, it's you know, we talk about old Oldsmobile. I just gave a huge spoiler. Well, it's a short story. I mean, they would have seen it no matter what. <laughs> uh, we talk about Old Boy, and that's a movie very much about the revenge impulse and the guy who yeah. has one, the guy who has one purpose to get revenge uh, because of, what has happened in his life and the, the way it's weirdly gone wrong from his point of view. Uh, but then it turns out the situation is a different one than he thought, a very different one, like in the girlfriend game, the, the story where the guy finds out it's a different situation than he thought. I mean, first, the the usefulness of revenge as a, as a, as a device in fiction, it seems like that's an evergreen. If mm -hmm. you have revenge, you have something. Evergreen. You, 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 you can the code name of the guy in, in Old Boy. It's yeah. possible. I could just be. I haven't seen the movie in a few uh, years, but uh, is it? I mean, revenge always kind of works. If you can, if you can yeah. build a story around it, uh, it's going to. You're going to have something, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the the genius of uh, the script of Old Boy, which is fucking phenomenal, is um, is there's not just a revenge story. I mean, it, it's a revenge story, but they've built in the investigation, too. So it's, it's right. you know, I'm trying to get my revenge, but uh, but but why why did this happen to me? Right. Why did this happen right. to me? It's 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 uh, it's a just a fantastic, fantastic script. Mm, it's that uh, there's the issue of having a character with he did get yeah, two ter two parallel missions going on there. Revenge. But what's going on? Even, right. you know, you that is a tricky thing I would imagine to introduce in a story, in a novel, having a character have, have a mission in, in his own mind, but also not quite knowing what's going on. How does that, what are the mechanics of that? When, when, when a character has to figure out just what, what the hell has happened, you know, as, as well, like, cause that seems like, it seems like you've had characters that also have to balance. Yeah. Like what, what is, what is this even like as they try to do what they think they need to do? I think it just gives you more to, more to play with as a storyteller and a writer. It just, it just gives you a lot more, um, audience investment. I mean, mm -hmm. audiences love revenge stories. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, there's something one note about, you know, I've been wronged at the beginning. Right. I know who did it and I'm going to get him and kill him. Right. Uh, and then, then, you know, there's always some twist in a revenge story. It's like, oh no, my girlfriend was in on it too or whatever. Yeah, but, so um, nice. but when you have a, a, a huge and, and credible mystery, uh, the way old boy does, um, I feel like that lends to, that inspires much greater audience investment. Hmm. Now, I think about the story where revenge is most upfront in the girlfriend game, the one you gave that, that synopsis of, and uh, I think of the main character, and he's the, the, the man he wants to kill, the guy who's gotten out of prison who killed his girlfriend years before, is, you know, he's not in very good shape. He's been in prison, but he, doesn't, he didn't start from much either. But the main character is also, uh, he's an alcoholic, and he's just, he's on the skids himself. You know, you, you're, you, you don't... How far from the skids do your characters get? I mean, they're not all, they're not all like that, but I mean, yeah, it's, it's, uh, they, none of them are untroubled in that sense. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think they're all on the skids in some way. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling as you're asking the question to think of like a character who's not, uh, at all. Some of them financially, I think, are doing fine. You know, I think the characters in the girlfriend game or, um, you know, Sophie Ann are, are okay, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, those are the interesting characters to write, you know, the ones who uh, are, are struggling. Uh, I'm just uh, kind of inherently not interested in writing characters who are 
um, wealthy and like doing okay. I, mm. I, I'm just, uh, this is partly my own, uh, uh, prejudice, but I'm just like not that interested mm. in, in rich characters. I don't, I don't like them I them or, or characters who like have it all together. Right. Um, I mean, I guess it can be interesting to see them lose everything sure, for sure. sure. Uh, but I don't have a huge amount of sympathy for them if they start. I'm like, ah, right. fuck them, you know. Like, <laughs> whereas if I if I if I start with uh, with a character who's just like down on her luck and and just trying to like make things work, or a character who's just been kind of consumed by revenge and everything else has fallen by the wayside, um, whatever flaws they might have, I'm interested in that character. And the migrations, the story of migration starts with, uh, you know, a character just like on a drunken bender, uh, <laughs> that's really disastrous and ends with like his own dog bites his finger off. And right. even though that character is a disaster, I know that if I read that story and I read the first paragraph where that happens, I'm interested in that character. Like I, I like him, you know, I kind of, kind of sympathize mm -hmm. with him. Right. It's, it seems to be important in these stories that you get the, you get the signal out there quickly that something bad happened. Yeah. Don't, don't worry. Something bad happened or will happen in the story. Like readers, <laughs> don't, don't be disappointed. It's a, stay tuned because something bad is going to or has happened. Yeah. Well, I think that that comes in part from just the lesson I learned early on about writing short stories, which is that, man, you have a limited amount of space right. and the first sentence better tell you something really interesting. If you, and I think I got that from, from Bradbury stories in particular, where mm. the first sentence always gives you something interesting. It right. always like, don't, don't close the book. Right. You know? And interesting here, it seems to be defined as something terrible, like yeah. something terrible happened. And we were in this, and this is a, this is a form of voyeurism on the reader's part, right? It's like, Oh boy, something terrible happened. Yeah. It just, uh, I mean, in, 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 in some cases, I mean, in other cases, it's just like, like a promise to the reader that, right. you know, I, Seriously, something interesting is going to happen. It's going to happen quickly. Like, um, uh, you know, the girlfriend game starts with uh, there's a game that my girlfriend and I play. And, you know, you go, what's the game? Yeah. Uh, and and I, I just feel like it's got to be something that, that hooks you quickly. Mm. Um, uh, one of the only exceptions is the first story, Rat Beast, where it's just like uh, because things go downhill so quickly, I had to start the story with like, uh, you know, things are great or, 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 or they were great. Uh, right. I guess that, that past tense is a slight promise that, um, right. you know, things won't be great mm. real soon. You talk about the, the, these qualities of the short story form and the, the, you know, that you've, you have written in the form of the novel and the form of the short story, and you've got the form of the novella coming up mm. as we've mentioned. What, what strengths do you do you enjoy when you're writing in a form like the novella that's in between um the freedom to well it, the freedom to make it as long or as short as i want i mean I, technically midnight picnic my second book is a novella mm -hmm. uh because it's under forty thousand words like thirty nine thousand five hundred or something uh, uh just barely <laughs> yeah it, oh. and and you know what it uh it won an award for best novella right. and if it had been 500 words longer it would have been the novel category where you know, I think the competition would have been much stronger. So I'm, I'm very glad that was a, that it, it it did that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I don't say that I don't plan to write something as a novella uh, or a novel. Um, I just get the story and then write it, and so it turns out. You know, the the obese, which is a novella, was a long short story, mm -hmm. uh, and it ended up being published as a novel. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't know until I'm finished. And the other thing is, I always cut a significant amount out of the first draft. Mm. I mean, at least 20%. So if I, if I have, uh, I might write something novel length and then just cut it down to a novella. Then mm. it's a novella. How did, how did cutting like that become important to you? Was that from day one, the way you were writing? I think so. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, that comes from reading writers who I really admire, particularly James Salter and mm. seeing how, um, how much economy there was in the stories and how few words you need hmm. and how little of the scene you have to set. You only need a, a couple details. Hmm. Uh, and uh, it also just feels nice. You know, it feels good to, to cut things out of the story. Hmm. Um, and the simpler you can be, the more they believe you. I hmm. think uh, the, the, the more direct the sentence is, the more the reader believes you. Hmm. And Sometimes you can get that directness when you just look for what's extraneous and cut it out. 
You've mentioned that you sometimes would call yourself a genre writer, sometimes you wouldn't. And when you're not a genre writer, you, you might be writing a relationship story, as you say. In the book, in the girlfriend game, it's it's uh, it's a sense I get that you see those two forms converging, don't you? Like, uh, not on not in every instance, and not in a sort of linear way, but uh, maybe it's just an experience the experience of reading the book straight through. But I feel like there's a bit of the overlap in the Venn diagram. There, you do have the relationship stories, you do have uh, the the more the more horrific ones. Mm-hmm. But then there's they, there is an overlap too, is there not? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a story that starts as a relationship story between a, a boyfriend and a girlfriend, and then they realize that uh, aliens are coming to Earth and they're mm-hmm. taking people, um, but they're only taking like the most attractive and interesting people. <laughs> so you know, if you're you're you kind of want to get taken, uh, uh, and also you're really jealous if they take you know your girlfriend, and uh, so that that's that's certainly a story where. The relationship stuff and the genre stuff is totally intertwined. Revenge is an evergreen, but sexual jealousy is an evergreen too, is it not? Absolutely, absolutely. It's, which one is greener? I mean, which which one do you really find more uh, more fuel in to mix that metaphor? Um, I think the most fuel would probably come from combining them into the same story because oh, they true. would mesh pretty pretty damn well. They they do dovetail well. I mean, they're. I, I'm trying to figure out the best way to to put this, but there's there's kind of a and there there is a seed of the horrific in sexual jealousy as well. Like you get the same impulse. Like I, you know, if if you if you a character who's who's getting really scared or a character who is very jealous, you get the same. You read you read their thoughts. You know, you get the same feeling. Like you feel the same way for them, don't you? Look, the 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 best movie. Uh, to watch on this subject is Possession with Sam Neill from yes, like, oh, if, yes. you know, this 81, one? Yeah. 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 Um, for Andre Zulowski. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 thank you. I can remember. Um, uh, for those who haven't seen this, it's Sam Neill and he's, he's in East Berlin, right? With, it's, it looks like East Berlin. I think it might be the West though. I mean, you watch it, it looks very dreary. Right. So I mean, you watch it. The money is on East Berlin. I think it might be the West, but it is Berlin. Yeah, yeah. And he, his wife is. Um, he believes she's cheating on him, and he starts following her. And it turns out she is cheating on him with this like giant octopus <laughs> monster that you know can please her more than he ever. It's just like a crazy, crazy movie, uh, and has. Yes. It's incredible. You got to see it. Watching Possession or reading your stories, I do get that impulse. Like you know. If uh, if my girlfriend leaves me for an octopus or whatever, mm-hmm. and I never have another relationship again, that's going to be okay. Like right. you get, it's, is that is that an intended an intended thing in your stories? Like you know, maybe maybe this is maybe this is all just too horrific, and I should recuse myself entirely from sexual life. Uh, I I don't think that impulse would last long. You know, I mean, I it never does. Right. But uh, that's it's something that reading this reading reading this this kind of thing. It's you've got to think it though. Don't uh, you? Well, maybe for a minute. I, it's <laughs> definitely not something I advocate. Uh, in any case, I have been speaking today at LARB HQ with Nick Antoska. He's the author of books including Fires, The Obese, Midnight Picnic, The Girlfriend Game, which is the new collection of short stories, and the upcoming novella in December, The Hangman's Ritual. Nick, thanks so much. Thank you. This has been the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I've been Colin Marshall. Find more from me at colinmarshall.org and more from the LARB at lareviewofbooks.org. Thanks.